morning. Man, that was a rock and roll in. Reminds me of my old mosh pit days. Well, if y'all don't know me, my name is David Simmons, and I get the honor and privilege of bringing the Word of God today. I'm super excited about it. And you know what? Before I get started, though, I've got to give props to Pastor Scott. Y'all know how great a pastor you have? Can I just tell you, y'all have amazing pastors? You know, he's not here this morning. This is the first Sunday he hasn't been here in over a year. And I said, Pastor, you need to take a day off. But you know what? This is my third time being up here and in the last couple of months. And I got to tell you all, it's not as easy as he makes it look, okay? He's up here 50-something times a year, not to mention classes, not to mention lay ministry, not to mention all the events. And he brings the word every single time. Deep revelation, man. He's bringing stakes every single Sunday. So I just want to say, man, Pastor Scott, if you're listening, we love you. This body loves you, and we appreciate you and Pastor Missy and all that you do. Amen. I also want to give a shout-out to Pastor Doug Gramillion for bringing the message last week. Woo! You know, he brought, he brought us a classroom experience. You see, here at Path Point, we're all about an experience. We don't just do a Sunday morning service. We want to have an experience. Isn't our vision to bring God and people together? And we do that through experiences. And we wanted to have a classroom experience to kind of give you a wet your whistle a little bit for our SOCI classes that are coming up. School of Spiritual Empowerment coming up this fall. People keep asking, when's registration open? It opens September 10th right there. I put it on the screen so everybody can know. September 10th, we're going to open registration. We've got our recovery class. We've got our Identity Foundations class that Pastor Doug gave us a little snippet of last week. Faith class. We're adding a Holy Spirit. Spirit and Power class this semester. So there's a lot of great classes that you can choose from. And we are here to give you spiritual skills for life. We want you to be victorious in every area of life. So I would encourage you now, be praying about which one of those classes you want to join, want to sign up for. But before we do that, guess what three weeks from today is? Covered our Psalms 91 experience. I wanted to start calling it P91X. But everybody was like, the exercise guy might not like that. But, you know, Psalms 91 experience, you know, P91X. But it's an amazing, amazing event. I'm telling you all, this is our biggest event of the year, first of all. Secondly, we have a rocking concert. Didn't you all love praise and worship this morning? Man, we do our praise and worship out in the field with huge speakers, just blasting the love of Jesus and the music of Jesus out across. The neighbors love it, you know, and so we just worship him. We have a great time. We have free food, okay? You can't, you can't beat that. We have so much food, we even have enough for seconds. So come enjoy that. We've got games for the kids. We've got bouncy houses. We've got giveaways and prizes. There's so much fun. BP's going to be there doing their shoe drive. There's so much that goes on. It's a wonderful event. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't registered, you should have gotten a text this morning. You can use that link. You can get on, on the website. You can use your insert. There's a QR code. Any of those, and you can register so that we can make sure we have plenty of food. Because I know some of y'all, I saw some of y'all had like two and three hamburgers just like going at it, man. So make sure you register so we can get that. Now, Pastor Scott's been doing the Ephesians prayers, and he's been praying these over the church. So do y'all mind if we pray those together? I want to pray that over us today. So let's read it together. In Ephesians 1, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Amen. Do y'all receive that this morning? Amen. That's been my prayer for us today, that the, that the Father God, the Holy Spirit would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that he would quicken our hearts this morning and speak to us this morning. Today, the title of my message is Authorized. Authorized, that word comes from the Oxford Dictionary, and that means having official permission or approval. 
official permission or approval. It comes from the word authority, which means the power or right to give orders. Man, Lily, can you say amen? You know, yeah, that's what I thought. The power or right to give orders, to make decisions and enforce obedience. I think about the policeman directing traffic. You ever been to an accident or somewhere, and there's a policeman directing traffic, and here you have a 200-pound person, and they're able to make a big old semi-truck come to a stop. Now, they don't have the physical ability, the physical power to make that stop. But what they do have is they have a little badge right here. And that badge says, I've been authorized by the city or by the state or whatever to tell you to enforce the laws. And so you have to stop. Same thing, even an inanimate object like a light sitting on a pole above an intersection. When it turns red, most everybody hits their brakes. Some of y'all in here, I know y'all, hit the gas, and I'm going to have an altar call at the end of the service. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, even that, just a light, it's not even alive, but it has been authorized to enforce the law, and we come to a stop at that red light. You see, we, too, have been authorized by Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read this for you. We call it the Great Commission, He gives it to us in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. So I want to read Matthew 28 right here. Jesus says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said that all authority was given to him. Now, you may have the question, well, didn't he already have authority because he's God? Well, let me explain. Remember in Genesis when God created the heavens and the earth and he created man, what did God tell Adam and Eve? He said, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. So God delegated power. He gave them authority over the earth. But you know what Adam did? He sold it out, and he said, oh, here you go, devil. I'll change that for this fruit. And so Satan became, as Paul says, the God, little g, of this world. In other words, he's the Lord of this world's system, this world's economic system, political system. He is the Lord of this world's system. And so Jesus came back died, was buried, was resurrected. He defeated death, hell, and the grave and the forces of darkness, and he took back that authority. And then what did he do with it? He delegated it to us. In verse 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples. What is that? Anybody remember English class and where you had to diagram sentences? And you know, what is the subject of this sentence? Go therefore. The verb is go. The subject is is what we call understood or implied, and that subject is what? You. You go, therefore, and make disciples. So he's authorizing us to go and make disciples. If we look at that word in the Greek for authority, that word in the Greek is exousia, and it means power, right, permission, delegated influence. It means strength. Freedom, and listen to this, it means jurisdiction or rule. Did you know you are to have jurisdiction over your sphere of influence? Jesus has authorized you to have jurisdiction, to have rule over your sphere of influence. What does that mean? I love it the way Pastor Scott says it. Don't let people touch your thermostat. You see, when when you go to my house, you don't touch Lily's thermostat, okay? Nobody touches the thermostat because mama will be up there like, who touched my thermostat? That's how it should be for us in the spirit. When I go to the office, negative Nancy or dirty Joe, they shouldn't be, or whoever the, the, the you know, those guys that like to say all the dirty jokes and the coarse jokes, that you shouldn't have to listen to them. They should know, hey, wait a second, they're different. See, you should have jurisdiction over your realm of authority. You shouldn't let that negativity take over your day. Now, it's going to try. 
because Satan wants to ruin your day, but you have authority. You have jurisdiction. The Bible, Jesus says to make disciples of all nations. What does that mean? It means to mentor people. It means to walk through life with people. It means invite people to church even. <gasps> no, invite people to church. You know, I was doing some research. Did you know that only 2% of church members invite people to church? Now, that's not here at Path Point. Uh, that's, that's everybody else, okay? But statistically st- speaking, in the United States, 2% of people, of church members, invite people to church. But did you know 83% of people that go to church were invited by a friend or family member. So 83% of people going to church were invited, yet only 2% of people are inviting. Could you imagine if we bumped that up to 50, 60%? Even if we only bumped it up to 10%. Man, what a difference it would make. But do you know why? You know why people don't invite people to church? Can I just be honest with you all this morning? People don't invite their coworkers to church because they don't live like Jesus at work. See, if I'm there telling the dirty jokes, if I'm there complaining and backbiting against the boss, if they don't even know that I'm a Christian at work, how am I going to invite them to church? Right? Can I speak the truth this morning? Pastor Scott has authorized me to speak the truth this morning, okay? In fact, he told me, you do it. Go ahead. Speak the truth. And so that's what I'm going to do this morning. You see, The thing is, we've been authorized and commissioned to change the world in his name, but why is it that so many people in the body of Christ don't walk in that authority? Some even cannot. Maybe you're one of those today that you're like, I wish I could walk in more authority in my life. I'm going to tell you today the secret to walking in authority over every situation in your life. Do you want to know what it is today? Amen. Good. I'm glad you're hungry for it. I'm going to start with a story, and this is going to tell us the secret. In Luke chapter 7, you guys are familiar with this, but I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll do a deep dive. Starting in verse 1, now he, that's Jesus, concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people. He entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And he was already not far from, when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under a, placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and he turned around and he said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. Now, we've heard this mess, this verse, this, this story many times concerning faith and faith messages. But I want to tell you, this is the secret to unlocking authority in your life. So I'm going to do a deep dive here, okay? First of all, the centurion, he's a Roman soldier. He sends some of the elders of the Jews to Jesus. Starting right off the bat, this is an odd picture, an odd scenario, because Jews and Romans don't get along. Remember the Rome, that Rome is an occupying force. They have conquered the land of Israel and all the surrounding areas, and they're an oppressive force. Remember, they put in puppet leaders like Herod who killed all those infants when he was trying to destroy Jesus. They could do what they want, take what they wanted. They charged exorbitant taxes. They cheated. They were corrupt. And so the Jews were looking for a Messiah not to deliver them from their sins, but to deliver them from Rome. You see, they missed the Messiah completely because they were looking 
for a physical Messiah and not a spiritual Messiah. And I think that's a word for somebody today. You've been looking for physical deliverance, and the Lord would tell you today you need spiritual deliverance. There is a spiritual answer to the question that you've had. And so, obviously, though, this centurion, he helps the Jews. He's helped fund their synagogue. So he's a a man that believes in God. And sometimes I wonder if he isn't the same centurion in Acts named Cornelius. Sometimes I wonder. There's no proof, but it's a very similar story. So this man has helped the Jews. So he sends a delegation of elders of the synagogue, the Jews. They come to Jesus. And here's what they do. They start to beg him and say, well, this man is worthy of you to come because he's done this and he's done that. You see, that is religion's way to try to get God to move. And that's why sometimes we don't walk in authority like we should because we're trying to beg God. We're trying to justify to God, well, listen, God, I've done this and I've done that and I sacrificed this and I gave up that, so I deserve for you to heal me. But you know what? Paul calls that self-righteousness, and he calls it filthy rags, worthy of the dung heap. See, I call it the elder brother syndrome, elder brother syndrome. You remember the story of the prodigal son? He goes out, he rebels, he comes back, asks for forgiveness, humbles himself, and the father holds a party. And the elder brother is enraged, and he says, but I've done this. I've never rebelled. I've never gone out. I've always done what you said. Why don't I get a party? And you see, many times Christians who've been a Christian for a long time, they fall into this trap. And they see young Christians getting healed, getting delivered on fire for God, and they're like, well, God, I've done this. I've lived for you for 25 years. Why don't I receive this? Because it doesn't matter. God has made us all worthy to receive from him. It doesn't matter if you're a newborn babe or been saved for 50 years. You are worthy to receive from the king of kings. He has cleansed you by his righteousness. He has made you a new creation in Christ. And you are worthy to be healed. But what you need to find out is the key that the centurion knew. And that is the secret of authority. You must no authority in order to receive the blessings of God. Amen? You see what the centurion knew in Luke 7. Let me say it again. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. The centurion recognized authority when he saw it. You see, first thing that he recognized, he recognized that Jesus was under authority authority. Didn't Jesus say in John chapter 5, I, the Son of Man, can do nothing in and of himself, but only that which the Father shows me, that will I do. You see, in Philippians, it says that Jesus stripped himself of all of his divine powers, all of his divine privileges, and humbled himself to become a man. So yes, he was God, but when he was on earth, he operated solely as a man. No power, no privilege from God, so he had to operate under the authority of the Father. And all the power that he had was because he was under God's authority. And the centurion saw this. He recognized it. How did he recognize it? Because he says, I am a man also under authority. If we look at, his, at this centurion's life, so a centurion, he is an officer, okay? He's over century, right? A hundred people. He's over a hundred people under him. But he started off, everybody starts at the basic, as the same old G.I. Joe, right? The basic grunt. They were called legionaries. And you had to enlist into the legionary. And you didn't get to do four years of service like we do here and then re-up if you want to. If you enlisted into the Roman army, it was 25 years minimum. 25 years. And you couldn't, like, change your mind 10 or 15 years into it be like, you know what, uh, Caesar, I decided I don't want to do this anymore. No, that didn't happen because if it did, guess what the penalty was? Death instantly. Okay? He had to go through four months of basic training where fatalities were not uncommon. Because in the Roman mind, if you're too weak to make it through the basic training, we don't want you in our army anyways. And so it was not uncommon for people to die in basic training. 
after his basic training, in order to pass it, he had to be able to march up to 30, 20 to 30 miles in full gear. Now, I brought a picture of some of the tack that he had to have. If you'll bring that up, guys, what is the gear that they had to have? It was 50 to 80 pounds, okay? He's got a giant shield. He's got, this is iron, okay? This isn't like Nerf War stuff, all right? It's not styrofoam. This is iron plates that he would wear with a heavy shield. This spear was very heavy, too. It was designed to be heavy. Plus, he had to have all of his digging tools because you know who built the Roman roads and the Roman aqueducts? The soldiers did. If they weren't fighting, they were digging and building. And so they would march 20 miles was your average march in full gear. Uh, they had to have their food with them, too. And they didn't just have, like, the little MREs, you know, that we have. They had to have, like, you know, a sack of potatoes, half a pig, that kind of thing. So they were carrying between 50 and 80, sometimes 100 pounds for 20 miles average march, 30 miles if they had to do a fast march. Then when they got there, they had to build camp. And because they're the Romans and everybody hates them, they can't just pop up a tent where they are and be like, well, we'll sleep fine tonight. No, they had to fortify the camp. They had to dig trenches and moats. They had to make cut down trees and make palisades, protection with the wood. Then they'd go to sleep for a few hours. Then they'd wake up, and guess what? They had to destroy everything they had made the night before because the enemy could use it against them. So they fill in all the holes, burn all the palisades they made, and then they'd march 20 to 30 miles again. Discipline was enforced to the max. They were forbidden to marry. Obedience to the chain of command was paramount. They had to be in that, in that either a century was 100, a legion was five to 6,000. They had to be able to move and act as one unit, as one man. And if you messed up, the punishment was what? Death. And they had to be obedient so much. In fact, if you look in the Bible in Acts, where you see Peter and Paul, remember that God would deliver them from jail several times? And every time the jailer is, what is he about to do? He's about to kill himself. Why? Because he knows that failure is death. And it wasn't just that. If you failed, the commanding officer, you didn't get a judge, you didn't get a trial, you didn't get a jury. He would just tell the person next to you, execute him. It could be your best friend that you've been in the trenches with for 10 years, but you had to be obedient to the chain of command. And so this centurion was risen up through the ranks until he became an officer, and he understood what authority means. You see, so many times we think, well, he said, I tell people to go and they go, and I tell people to come and they come, and that's what authority means. No, authority means you're under somebody first. Then you get the right to tell people what to do. But you see, the problem today is we have a lot of people who want to be in authority, but not under authority. But you cannot walk in authority unless you are under authority. I'm going to say it again. You cannot walk in authority unless you are under authority. Think about it many years ago. If somebody wanted to learn a trade, as a young man, sometimes even a boy, a teenager, they would go to the master, whether he was a shipbuilder or a tailor or a cobbler, they would go to the master and they would become their apprentice and they would learn the skills of the trade. They wouldn't go tell them what to do. Be like, hey, I'm 15 years old. I'm going to tell you how to run your job. No, they wouldn't do that. They would go learn from the master. I think about like Mr. Miyagi and Daniel's son. Remember, in Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. And he's thinking, Mr. Miyagi just wants me to wash and wax all his cars for him because he's lazy. But no, what was he teaching him? He was teaching him the master of the block. And so he was teaching him these skills. I think about Star Wars. Now, you know, if I'm up here, you all know that I'm going to bring some nerdery shenanigans, Okay. So I have to bring Star Wars when we're talking about apprentices and masters, okay? You think about in Star Wars, if you're not familiar with the Star Wars universe, I'll tell you a little bit about it, okay? So it's in a galaxy far, far away, all right? 
And so all these guys, they're riding spaceships and going around with blaster rifles and stuff. And the coolest dudes in Star Wars are the Jedis, right? The Jedis, yeah, see, somebody else is a nerd too. And they're like the samurais, okay? They go around, and they're kind of like the police, and they keep the bad guys in order. And they carry, instead of samurai swords, they carry these lightsabers that are like, you know, they can like cut through steel and deflect laser beams and stuff. So it's really, really cool. You want to be a Jedi. But you see, in order to be a Jedi, they had to start when they were young, and they had to train under a master. They called them apprentices or Padawans. And they would spend years training under their master. And eventually, after several years of working and training and listening and obeying, he would finally get to the next step, the next level, where he got his lightsaber. And the lightsaber is where you are like, now I have arrived. Now I can become a Jedi. But you see, novices didn't get one because if you got one, you would hurt yourself, wouldn't you? And so novices don't get lightsabers. And I have a real-life Star Wars story to tell you about this. Can you, do you all want to hear a real-life Star Wars story? Can, can you believe there's actually a real-life Star Wars story? That there is. I'm going to tell it to you, okay? My mentor back in Longview, he, he trained me up in business, in government, in leadership, and he's a big gamer. And the reason he's a big gamer is because his big brother was a big gamer, big enough that he was the lead design working for Sony Industries. And he was the lead design for a Star Wars game back in the early 2000s. It was the first Star Wars game to be online with multiplayer. And so there were people, they had over a million subscribers, people all over the world that would log on and they would get into this Star Wars universe. And they'd fly their spaceships around, and they'd, you know, build their little blaster rifles and shoot each other, all kinds of stuff. And it was a big, very popular game. But what made it very popular was that if you wanted to become a Jedi, you had to earn it. You had to train for it. You couldn't even become a Jedi until you had played at least four months and then you didn't get a lightsaber right away. You had to play many more months. Sometimes it would take people a year or two before they had gotten the levels to where they could have a lightsaber. And so I know this is like some of you are like, oh, my gosh, what a waste of time. But, okay, some people really take this seriously, okay? And when they would see a Jedi going around in the game with a lightsaber, they were like, whoa, that dude knows how to play the game. Don't mess with him. And so it became very popular. Well, as what happens with big corporations, the uh, corporate gurus got together with the marketing gurus, and they decided, you know what, a million subscribers isn't enough. We need to get more, and we need to reach the younger generation. We need to get these kids playing, and these kids aren't going to want to spend six months trying to get a lightsaber and become a Jedi. We need to make it so that they can get a lightsaber on day one. And he tries to tell him, listen, that's a bad idea. You got people that have been playing this game for years. And the whole point of it is to try to make it true to life and earn the lightsaber. But they said, no, we did the market research. It's going to be great. So go ahead and, and redesign it. So he did, and they did an, up, an update. And the update completely redesigned the game so that everybody that wanted could get a lightsaber on day one. Y'all want to guess what happened? Within a few months, they went from over a million subscribers to in the thousands. They had like 10,000 subscribers. It was a huge loss for them. Uh, it was a, 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 a killer for his career. It was kind of a tragic story, but here's the lesson that they learned. You can't have a lightsaber on the first day. You cannot have a lightsaber on day one. How many people as a manager have I seen come in and they've worked their job for a month or two and they say, where's my promotion? Where's my raise? Well, dude, you've been here for three months. You're late half the time. You barely know what you're doing. You're not going to get a raise or promotion. But you see, people want a lightsaber on day one. How many people have said, well, you know what? I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. That makes me an expert. <laughs> Everybody, anybody met one of those people that's an expert on everything? Look, I love YouTube videos. YouTube helped me change my garbage disposal, okay? But that doesn't make me a plumber. Just ask my wife, okay? Because I had to watch several more to fix all the mistakes that I made. 
Can you imagine uh, if I went to Dr. Ocko and I said, hey, I'm going to take over your business for you because I've watched a lot of YouTube videos about health and science. Don't worry. Take a vacation. I got it covered. No. But we have a lot of people that they want that lightsaber on day one. Or we have people with no ministry experience that come into the church that try to tell the pastors how to run their church. Y'all, it doesn't work that way. Man, I saw in, on my social media, it came up this week, a young man, he was a podcaster, and the title of his podcast was Scriptures Ministers Use to Keep Us from Giving Them Positive Criticism. And I said, hold on a second right now. First of all, you're not even 30, and I'm not knocking young people at all, okay? I'm not knocking them at all. I know a lot of young people with a lot of wisdom and experience. But I researched this guy. He had no ministry experience, none whatsoever. He didn't pastor a church. He wasn't a traveling minister. He had just watched enough YouTube videos to think that he was an expert on how to tell pastors. He said, I need to give them some constructive criticism. Let me tell you something. Constructive criticism comes from the top down. It doesn't ever come from the bottom up. I don't have the right to tell my pastor how to run his church because I'm not there at the top. I don't understand everything. I can't tell you how many times, whether in the office or at church, somebody would come in mad. When I was the boss, they'd come in mad. Oh, fuming, screaming, calling me all kinds of names. I can't believe you fired my friend. My friend, he's such a good man. He's a family man. He's married. He's got a wife. He's got four kids. He could barely survive on that pittance of a salary you gave him, and now you fired him, and they'd call me all kinds of names. But what they didn't know and what I wasn't going to tell them was, well, I fired your friend because he failed his drug test. Or I fired your friend because the police came to my office with a warrant for his arrest. But you see, I'm going to protect his privacy. And besides that, it's none of your business anyways. But you see, we've got people that they don't know everything, and they want to tell the boss how to run it, but they don't know it. I've had so many people come to the church mad at my parents. Now, look, I'm not talking about anybody here, okay? I want to throw this out here. I have used examples today from everything before I ever came to Amarillo because I don't want anybody to think that I'm talking about them, okay? But when my parents are pastors, and we saw people would come in, they try to tell my dad how to run the church. No ministry experience whatsoever. We had a couple, when he told them that he wasn't going to let them run the church, they asked for their tithes back. <laughs> and you know what my dad did? Oh, I was so proud of him. He said, here's a check. You don't even give anything anyways. Here you go. Take it back. Did you see? They didn't know. Oh, so many examples I could tell you guys. But you see, when you're under authority now, when you put yourself under the boss, the boss will come to you and say, hey, I want some of your ideas. I want you to show me some things. You see the difference between me trying to tell the boss how to do my job and the boss coming to me because I've submitted under authority. See, my dad always taught me, if it's not illegal or immoral, do what the boss says. And boy, people, you know, all my coworkers, oh, you, you, you're just a brown noser. You're just sucking up to the boss. Well, you know what? I'm just doing my job. I'm being under authority. But you know what happens when you're the one under authority? Guess who gets the promotions? The one that's under authority. The one that's under authority. Well, the same principle in the spirit and the physical, they apply together. You see, if it works in the office, it'll work in your spiritual life. If it works in church, it'll work in your office. It'll work in your family. You see, when we put ourselves under authority, we can grow. Nobody gets a lightsaber on the first day. Hebrews 4.12, Pastor Doug read this last week. For the word of God is living and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, the word of God is a piercing weapon, just like that lightsaber. And in the hands of a novice, it can be damaging, can't it? Anybody ever been cut up by somebody using uh, the Word of God the wrong way? Anybody ever had that happen to them? But you know what? I think about the Word of God in the hands of somebody like Pastor Scott, and it becomes like a scalpel. It's able to apply surgical precision, and it can just go right into your heart and just cut out 
that little piece. Because, see, most, most people, we're not trying to do bad. We're not trying to be messed up and have sin in our lives. But, you know, we live in a world that's fallen. We live in a sinful world. And, see, we live with an enemy who hates authority. He's the first rebel, is he not? And if there's anyone in authority, he's going to come against them. And so he's constantly pushing at us, pushing at us, pushing at us. But when we come to church, especially a church like this, and we allow the word of God to just come in and quicken our hearts and just make little snips here and little cuts there, it grows us in the authority and in the power that we can have in our lives. When we place ourselves under authority, we're given authority. Now, very quickly, I want to tell you, what is the chain of command, the chain of authority. You hear Pastor Scott talk about the chain of authority. I want to read it to you quickly here. We found it in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says this, anyone who receives you receives me. Anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as a prophet. If you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Do you see that Jesus is making a list here? He's making an order. And it starts off, if you receive me, you receive the Father. The Father's at the top. Remember, Jesus said, I only do what the Father says. Then there's Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, the Spirit of truth will speak only that which he hears, that which the Father tells him. Then he talks about receiving the prophet and the prophet's reward. That's the fivefold ministry. That when we receive from the fivefold ministry, we receive that reward. And then there's elders in the faith, and then there's new believers. Peter gives us a similar thing where he says, Likewise, you younger people, in 1 Peter 5 5, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He's telling us to submit to each other. See, submission and authority, they work together. Young people, I want to encourage you today, don't be afraid to listen to your parents. Don't be afraid to submit to authority. See, it bucks against the the youthfulness, right? In the youth, we're kind of naturally rebellious. But here's another thing that's been working against our youth. If you've ever noticed this, I began watching this several years ago when my kids started watching their cartoons. Did you notice over the last 20 years, every single cartoon, every single sitcom that involves families, the parents are always stupid, always. And the kids are the ones that have to show the parents how to live life, how to tell them what to do. You see, we're breeding a rebellious generation. We're teaching our kids that parents don't know anything. Adults don't know anything. Grown-ups are stupid. They're out of touch with reality. But that is not the case. So young people, listen. They have life experience. So they don't know how to run a computer like you do. So they're not as technologically savvy as you are, but they have life experience. That They have wisdom that they've learned from what we call the school of hard knocks. And believe me, if I can learn from somebody else's mistakes, I'd much rather do that than get beat up myself. But now adults, grown-ups, those of us with a little more wisdom and different colored hair, all right, I want to tell us something too, though. Don't write off this generation They may think differently than us. They may act differently than us, but don't write them off. I'm telling you what, they're going to be the ones that usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we better not write them off or we're going to miss out on a whole move of God. And so here's what we do. When Jesus says make disciples, that means that we are to go to those young people, whether it's in the office or at church, and we're to mentor them. Instead of just ignoring them and saying, well, those are millennials, those are Gen Zs. No, we are to bring them under our wings and train them. Well, what if they train up so much that they they could take my place on the job? Good. That's what you're supposed to do. You should be believing God that you're going to get promoted anyways. So I should be training somebody underneath me to, to take my place. I got so sick and tired of hearing people, they would keep secrets, right? When they would train somebody, they'd train them 
part way, but they'd keep a little bit back. So for job security, y'all, that's a bunch of fear, and that is letting Satan run your life. You should train them every way and every how so that, yeah, they could take my job. I want them to take my job because I want God to promote me. And so if I'm willing to do what he says and mentor those underneath me, then I can be promoted. Amen. So don't write off this generation. Notice that Jesus said in Matthew 10 that we just read that we will be rewarded for authority. He talked about the prophet's reward. He talked about the righteous man's reward. You see, there is a reward for being under this chain of authority. I think about John Bevere. He was telling us a story one time about how a youth pastor, he was a youth pastor, and he came in and he took over because the youth pastor had left mad and offended, and he split the church, and he went and started his own ministry. Now, let me just tell you right here, that ministry is doomed to fail. It will not succeed. If you start a business or a ministry out of offense, out of being angry, out of they wronged me, so I'm going to do my own thing, I can promise you 100% guaranteed you will fail because God does not promote rebellion. And when we split off, it can't succeed. It just won't. So John Bevere comes, and he takes over this youth ministry, and there's a young youth volunteer, and he works with him for several months. And after a few months, the the volunteer says, "Uh, Pastor John, will you be my buddy? And he's like, what? He said, well, you know, the other youth pastor, he and I, we were like buddies, man. He said, we did everything together. We hung out. We went and did stuff together. I went to his house. We were just like best friends, best buds. And the Lord quickened him with this scripture, and he read it to the man about the prophet's reward. And he said, well, let me ask you this. Do you want the buddy reward, or do you want the youth pastor reward? And the Lord opened the guy's eyes, and he said, uh, I think I want the youth pastor's reward. And, you know, Pastor Scott did the same thing. The prophet came to him and said, do you want the brother-in-law's reward or do you want the prophet's reward? And he said, I want the prophet's reward. And he submitted himself under his authority. He still submitted under his authority, and that's why he operates in the power that he does. Because he's submitted himself to authority. He's submitted himself to a board of directors. And because he's submitted, it's like electricity. When you go in and the light is off, The power is there, but it's been disconnected. But as soon as I flip the light switch on, it reconnects, and the light is on instantly. When we submit ourselves under authority, that power is available to us. As soon as we get out from under authority, the impedance, the switch is off. So we just need to get back under. Lastly, in Mark 16, This is the Great Commission in Mark, and I saved this for last because I know this was a hard message. So I said, I got to save the good part for last because I've been kind of hard today. But you know what? We need to hear this sometimes. But you know what also you need to hear? You may be walking under authority. You may be serving where you're supposed to be, and it's time for you to take it because your enemy wants to keep you from walking in authority. So take the authority that belongs to you. Jesus said in Mark 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, and they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Again, the understood subject is you. Jesus is telling us in Mark 16, when we submit ourselves under his chain of authority, we have access to powerful divine privileges. We heard in Matthew where he said rewards. In Mark, I'm calling them divine privileges. He categorizes four different areas of divine privilege. The first one, he says, is you'll have divine authority over the forces of darkness, He says you'll cast out demons in his name. You see, if you walk under the authority of Jesus, you have authority over darkness. Now, remember, the disciples, they couldn't do it. They struggled casting the demons out. 
because they weren't in the authority that they needed to be until later, and then they fled from them. Divine privilege number two is divine communication through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, in 1 Corinthians 14, when we speak in tongues, it says we're speaking mysteries. Mysteries. It's like a code that Satan can't break. He can't understand. And so when you're praying out your future by praying out in tongues, he doesn't understand what that future is, and it's harder for him to hinder it. Whereas if I only pray in English all the time, he knows what I'm praying. That's why praying in tongues, it's a divine privilege. It's a powerful tool that we have. But you see, you have to be under authority, do you not, to pray in tongues? It says the Spirit gives us utterance, but who does the speaking? We do. Divine privilege number three is divine protection. Now, I, it should go without saying, but when he says take up serpents, he's talking about protection. He's talking about accidents, okay? We're not going to bring out rattlesnakes and have a snake service, okay? I find it very interesting that the rattlesnake people, they don't take the other half of the scripture. They don't drink hemlock and strychnine, right? I'm like, well, if you're going to bring out the rattlesnakes, bring out the poison. Come on, y'all. Let's do it all. No, because he's talking about divine protection, guys. He's talking about in Acts when Paul gets shipwrecked on an island and he's gathering firewood. What happens? A snake, a venomous snake bites him. He shakes it off in the fire. And the natives who were thinking, this dude is going to die and we're going to just sit back and enjoy the show. And all of a sudden, after 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, they're like, whoa. Maybe he's a God, and then he's able to minister the gospel to that entire nation because of that. Divine protection. When you are under authority, you are under divine protection. That's why I don't ever want to get out from under my church because there's a covering over this church. Think about our Psalms 91 experience. What is it? We're putting ourselves under the authority. When Pastor Scott lays hands on us in that safety line, we are saying, I submit to your authority and I receive the blessing of protection because of it. Does that make sense? Under authority, there's a covering. There's a protection. The very last privilege that he tells us, divine privilege number four is divine health. He says, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Lay hands on the sick. Did you know you can lay hands on yourself, on your spouse, on your kids? When I was a little, a little kid, I suffered terrible childhood migraines, terrible. All my sisters would be out playing and my cousins out having a great time in the summer, and I'd be in a dark room with a cloth on my head for hours, days at a time sometimes, throwing up because of the pain. And I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. Well, when I was 12, my dad was called to Rama, and he went to Rama. and Brother Hagen came up. I don't even remember when it was. One night, he came up, and he said, the Holy Ghost says there's somebody here who's dealing with migraines. He says, stand up. So I stood up, and he said, I'm not coming to you. The power of God's available here. You just lay hands on yourself. I said, okay, I'm 12 years old. <laughs> I just smacked my head and put my hand on my head and laid hands on myself. I didn't think anything about it. It wasn't until about two or three years later when I'm in high school and I'm like, wait a second, I haven't had one of those migraines since then. You see, God healed me because I put myself under authority. And when he said, lay hands on yourself, I said, yes, sir, I lay hands on myself and I received that healing. And so today I want to tell you, God wants you to have every tool available for you. And one of the biggest tools to make you successful in this life is the tool of authority. For when you put yourself under authority, God will always put you in authority. Even though this was a heavy message, it's an important reminder for us to keep ourselves under the chain of authority where we can find grace, freedom, and protection. Let's look at our next step. I will keep myself in the chain of authority and fulfill the great commission on my life. Did you all receive that this morning? As the worship teams comes up, I just want to tell you all that we love you. I love you. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for putting yourselves under authority and listening and receiving what God has for you today. And if you're one of those people that you've been 
struggling. Maybe you've been outside the chain of authority. Maybe you've got upset. Maybe you've got offended. Maybe it was on the job. Maybe it was at church. Maybe it was somebody here. Maybe it was me. I want to tell you today, get back under the place of authority. It just takes a simple heart change. I don't need to call you up here and lay hands on you. you don't, we don't need to have a crying service and weeping. No, it's just a simple adjustment in the heart. And then for those of you who are walking under authority and you've been there for a long time and you're waiting for the promotion to come, you're waiting to see the authority in your sphere of influence, I want to tell you, keep doing what you're doing. Galatians says, don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. Take heart this morning. God has a plan for your life. He wants you to walk in victory, in authority, in jurisdiction and rule, so that when you walk into your office, people know that's a boss. You may be the guy sweeping the floors, cleaning the toilets, but they know there's something about him. He carries something. She carries something in her spirit that says, whoa, respect them. And the, de- the devils and the demons flee because they say there's somebody who knows authority. There's somebody who knows who they are and who walks in the power of God. Avoid them. It takes a fight, my friends, because Satan doesn't want you to walk in authority. But if you will fight and you will say, nobody touches my thermostat, you will get to the place where you will walk in that authority. Amen. Do you receive that today? Would you stand with me? I'm just going to pray a prayer over you today. Father God, I lift up the people of Path Point Fellowship Church. God, I love these people so much. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for bringing us here to be with this family. Such beautiful people, beautiful pastors. And I just lift them up today, Holy Spirit. I thank you that they are a people of God submitted to your authority, to submit it to your chain of command. And I thank you that they walk in all the blessing that you have for them, that they walk in all of the authority and the rule and the power and the might and the freedom that you bought and purchased for them, Lord. I pray that as they go forth this week unto their jobs, Lord, that they will go forth with renewed vigor, that they have the authority and the power of God. Lord, that they would go forth able to be mentors and disciple people, to bring people into this body, that they may find the truth of your word and the life-saving message that we have right here at Path Point, Father God. I thank you for blessing them as they go today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, as you leave, remember our tithes and offerings are back here. If you have a tithe or an offering, you can put them in the box. I just want to send you out. Today, you're the head. You're not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. Because you are submitted under authority, I declare over your life, you walk in all power, all authority. You walk in full jurisdiction and rule in every area of influence in your life. I decree that you prosper, and everything you set your hands to shall prosper. Go forth in the health, the healing, and the blessing of the Lord today and this week. Point someone to the path. You are dismissed. Amen.